Welcome back to Daily Encouragement. I'm here with my brother Seamus. You've seen him on previous support, uh, performances such as How to Float with Eagles, How to Fly with Zebras. America's Home Funniest Videos. <laughs> yeah, that's most likely. And uh, the last couple of videos, yeah. um, I know you're an avid viewer, Seamus, so you've seen all of them. I know you know all of these details, but we've been talking about... Because I'm just reminding the viewer because I know you know yes, all, everything. Of course. Uh, diligently, you yeah. watch everything three times. Absolutely. I can see it on the metrics. Um, we've been talking about David. And on Saturday, I recorded a video here in this, in this building where I started out in, the, in, in mom's office. And I said, this is not my position. Uh, even if I could figure out I some of this. I watched that one. You did? I well, watched, uh, you I watched all it. of them. I liked it. It was a good transition. So for the viewer... Uh, we record, I, I, what I said was, you got to get into position. And what you got to do is you got to practice in the private place so when your moment of uh, promotion comes, that you know how to produce on the public spectrum. A lot of peace. A lot of peace. And uh, if, you, if you don't push through the pain of your brothers hating you, we're, we're brothers, but if you don't push through the pain of your brothers ridiculing you and trying to pull you down, uh, then you're not actually qualified to handle the pressure that comes when you actually get the promotion. Yeah, I've, I've watched all three of those. Really, really good. Okay, you have really watched good. I have. Avidly, yeah. I like, I like that, um, that idea that if you haven't paid the price, you haven't practiced, you haven't developed a thick skin where you are able to take the criticism of your family and close friends, that you don't deserve the right to have that position. I love that because it's so true. There's nothing worse than being led by somebody who shouldn't be in that position. It's so frustrating and disappointing when low capacity people are leading. Yeah. And we've always spoken about this. Everything rise and falls. Everything hinges on leadership. John Maxwell. And if anything that needs to change in your business, in your relationships, in your 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 uh, politics, it's good leadership, and it's people taking shortcuts not to develop practice, yeah, not to develop the the process. They don't they don't invest or give themselves to the pain of that process, and I, we're all talking about ourselves when we say that. But but ultimately, people who've gone through that process, they come out the other side with a level of maturity but also humility hmm. and it, you can tell people who've you can tell the person who's gone through that process because they're not arrogant and very often people in leadership who are arrogant it's just a hallmark for me hmm. of somebody who hasn't gone through the process wow because you can't be arrogant if you've gone through the pain yeah you know but also you don't get credibility with people but people People can smell when someone's in a leadership position because they know somebody or, or somehow they took a shortcut. People can smell it. They can smell yeah. that arrogance. And then you don't get that credibility. And then people double down on, hold on, I'm the leader here. And, yeah. and uh, it's a painful thing for everyone else. Yeah. 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 I mean, if you've ever read, and I advise you to read it, it's John Maxwell's Levels of Leadership. Five Levels of Leadership. Five Levels of Leadership. And it's, it's incredible. It's so, like, you read it and you just see people's faces. You see your own face on yeah. that list. And it's very humbling to understand that there is a process to earn people's trust. Yeah. You can't be a level one leader, which is, I'm the boss, do what I tell you to do. You know how many times I've done that with my kids, with my marriage, with business, and it's just the worst. Yeah. It's... It's, it's important to be the boss and it, know you're the boss, but it's the worst way to lead. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. I mean, look at David. He, he, um, uh, he seemed to have this charisma which attracted the rejects. But these weren't rejects because they weren't producing. These were rejects who were highly productive. Yes. Highly dangerous men who were wild hmm. but yet in their rebellion and their wildness completely surrender their lives to a to an outlaw king yeah you have to have a lot of credibility to lead people who are high capacity yeah and that's what the process does is it allows you to have that passport another p to to travel into people's lives and deal with them 
in a way that gives you credibility and leadership. What is that, that credibility? Well, you always talk about it. You talk about it like an ATM machine. You can't draw out uh, unless you put in. Hmm. Um, when I was teaching uh, at a institute here in Hong Kong, there's a group of boys that we taught in an organization and they were basically expelled from school because they didn't attend for various reasons, whether it was drug related or even computer addiction, computer game addiction. And these boys, on the first few lessons, I had no, they didn't know who I was. I didn't have any credibility with them. There was no way they were going to listen to me because I was just this outsider. Just another voice telling them what to do and how to do it. And they had been able to reject their own parents. They were able to reject their various schools and various teachers. And they had come to a point in their lives where they didn't have any hope hmm. and they didn't care. Anyone reaching out to them was just another annoyance. And you walk into a classroom filled with boys like that and you think to yourself, how on earth can I make a difference? But what was amazing is that I was working with an organization that was Christian and they were praying and they were putting things into these boys without asking anything in return. And as I started moving in that flow and started showing them love and showing them that I wasn't here to get something out of them, mm. but I was here to give something into them, that relationship took time. And as that started to develop, these boys would bend over backwards to, to help me. They mm. would show an interest in anything I was doing. They would, if, if I ever, there was one time I was walking down the road and they were doing an outreach as part of the organization. They had completely changed their lives. And when I walked past and saw them, it wasn't like, oh, there's the teacher. It was like this passionate <laughs> embrace and this celebration. And that, that doesn't happen because... I did something amazing. Hmm. I, that happens because it's a, a process hmm. of developing trust. And it's a, a repetitive action of laying down your, your own uh, ego and laying down everything that and working out the communication between them. And that's like you say, the ATM, you cannot withdraw cash unless you put something in. Hmm. And so if you want to develop any relationship You've got to put in. You've yeah. got to put in. Um, selfless love, parenting. I mean, you just go through the whole list of any relationship you have. If you want a stronger, deeper, longer lasting relationship, sounds like an advert. <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to sacrifice. Yeah. Love is laying down your life yeah. for someone else. That's good. Yeah. He was chased away by the king, and, and I imagine that those other guys that gathered around him were also chased away from the kingdom for various reasons. Mm. If Saul is operating under that witchcraft spirit that, we, that Rob and I spoke about, then anyone who is able to produce is not welcome because you need to be top of the game. That's right. And so you push others down. And, and uh, those people often are willing to give you their production. You think about a good old house, house cat, the first thing it does after it kills the rat or the bird, it brings it to its owner and says, hey, look at what I've done. Yeah. There's something in nature that's, that wants to show off your production, right? Mm. And so those men, I'm sure, I'm, I'm just guessing, I'm reading between all the lines, but they would have won battles, they would have done amazing things. And they would have come to Saul and said, hey, look at what we've done. And he would have been jealous or upset. I don't think David would have been the only one. Yeah. And and so that there was this twisted idea that I've got to push them down. When they saw someone who could produce, he killed the giant. Uh, and he wasn't insecure about others producing because his boys then went and killed another four giants. Altogether, his crew killed five giants. Remember how many stones he, he picked up before he went into the Goliath battle. He knew there was an agenda there to sort out this problem over Israel's territory. And they, he wouldn't have been insecure by them producing. And so they felt like they were joined to him because here's a guy we can follow because we're allowed to be who we want to be. Yes. I think that's one of the biggest yes. ways for people who you're leading, if you're, if you're leading in any context, is, is giving them credit where they've been able to produce mm. and giving them credit for something they've won in and mm. giving them the room to enjoy that and celebrate them in that. Yeah. And that is a form of credibility. Yeah. And so I think that's what happened is 
these guys were ousted because Saul has to look like the big boy. He has to get it all done. And, and they couldn't produce. But under David, they killed a whole pile of yeah. giants. Yeah, it's interesting because you've got Saul, who was a donkey. Donkey farmer. Donkey farmer. And you've got David, the shepherd. Now, when David arrives at the scene, you look at the level of leadership that Saul has. Dun- you know, donkeys are stubborn. Yeah. They're really hard. You know, you just, I'm the boss. You do what I tell you to do. If you look at the capacity of, Dave, uh, of Saul's army, what were they were doing when David arrived? They were hiding. Yeah. They were, they were scared. Yeah, running. Their leader, who was head and shoulders above the rest, was the worst of them. And then David, this nobody, even overlooked by his own father, comes in and understands, I need to, I need to fit in with this covenant. Wow. And as he flowed with that covenant, it is sp- inspired the whole army to chase the enemies away. Wow. That's why they sang that song, Saul killed this many, but David killed this yeah. many. Because they went from a donkey farmer to a shepherd. Wow. And there's something in that where you, as a leader, are able to move away from the stubborn, hit the donkey, do what I tell you, yeah. and move into the shepherd who leads, that leads ahead, and there's sheep just trust. Hmm. That's a relationship. And um, yeah, I think, I think we all aspire to lead, but we also, there's a lot of us who aspire to be led by a shepherd. Yeah. There's many roles to be played. We all want to be leading and we all want to be led. And that's, that's, a, that's a process that we grow. I think a good leader is someone who knows how to follow. Yes. They understand that relationship. And I think some of the best leaders I've seen uh, are very humble people. As you said, right at the beginning, they've been through processes. And so a lot of that crap has been ground out of them. And so they generally very, I mean, you get a few exceptions to the rule. Uh, but they they humble, and because they know how to follow, because because they know what it's like to lead, it makes them a better leader, which makes them a better follower. It makes, and so you create this environment where people are able to go to new levels of of production and finding out who they are, because there's this dynamic that that encourages a flow of humility. Another interesting thing about the comparison between David and Saul was in the beginning of Saul's journey. He started with all the advantages. He started with 30 men. David didn't start with 30 men. He started as an outcast. But, you know, he ended up with David's 30 mighty men. Uh, Saul started being head and shoulders above the rest, above his peers. David wasn't invited to the party when the king was going to be anointed. He was out in in the field. Uh, Saul was called out by the prophet in public he was sat in the the fancy place at the head of the table and and it's all like Saul's going to be the main man yay and everyone's cheering David was in secret Samuel couldn't even say why he was going to Jesse's house he had to say you know I'm going up to celebrate a feast he couldn't even announce publicly that David was going to be anointed greatest so king the, the greatest king was all in secret it was all like oh can we really Jesus. Jesus beautiful yeah started in a manger yeah. dirty old horrible animal infested place and so there's something to be said for this position that's just given freely that uh, you start with all the advantages and you're given everything Mm -hmm. and it's all by man and it's all on the outside and there's something to be said when God promotes you despite what's happening on the outside and or often in it's in contradiction to what's happening in the outside that there's something eternal like Saul was anointed with a flask which is a container for the anointing, but it's temporary. David was anointed with a horn, which speaks of authority and eternity. And so he came into his, his position by something that was eternal. That was the, the prophetic word through Hannah, Samuel's mother, who then anointed David. And so there's an eternal aspect to those who are, lead, who are leading by God's placement as opposed to the temporary placement of man. And I think that's one of the clearest things. When you want to do a study as we've all done, on, uh, on leadership. David, I can't think of a better example than David and Saul. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. But bringing the New Testament to that, Simon Peter hears, oh, we've, we've, they were, they were uh, disciples of John the Baptist. Yeah. And they had encountered Jesus whilst he's being baptized. And they came up to Simon Peter and said, we've met the Messiah. We've seen him. 
And he goes, oh, who is he? It's Jesus of Nazareth. And his statement is, Nazareth? <laughs> Can anything good come from Nazareth? Yeah. And it's almost like it's a, a special way that God likes to upturn things. Yeah. He says, you've got your credibility, you've got your certificates, you've got your, all your pedigrees. Let's get rid of that. Let's use earthen vessels. Yeah. Let's use broken vessels to fill these things with my glory. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's that humility, getting rid of that love of man and, and that need to be accredited by man. But actually, your accreditation mm. comes from God. No one saw David kill that bear or kill that wow. No one saw it, right? He would come back and go, I killed it. Unless he had some kind of trophy or lion's head or stuff. No one's going to go, ah, you didn't do it. Yeah. They probably didn't believe him. But you know what? God saw it. Hmm. And there is a heavenly economy that attributes, that, that, that says, starts marking things. Not that we earn God's favor, but that God puts us through a process. And that leadership is a very important process yeah. that you, you earn your stripes through the practice and yeah. the process and the pain so that you have the credibility to walk other people through the same process. I like that. Yeah. Earn stripes as opposed to a positional stripe. Yes. You just get it now, I'm the boss and I have to. Yeah. But actually when you walk through that process, people can see an earned stripe. Yeah. They can smell an earned stripe more yeah. than they can something that's just placed on your shoulder from the outside. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Any other comments on David? Good guy. Good guy. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll continue talking about David. He's, he's a integral character in terms of the new covenant because that's the throne that Jesus sits on. But he's a very interesting character because there's so many nuances mm. and uh, little tidbits of information that at a cursory reading, it, you can gloss over and miss. But when you really go deeper and you search and you read and read and you read yeah. the, the Samuel uh, uh, story and you read the Chronicle story and you put those things together, it is beautiful tapestry. Yeah. And, and uh, we'll maybe talk about the tent as well and all that sort of stuff relating to the new covenant. But... Um, Great show. Thanks Thank very, very much. much. See you next time.